Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming out on this beautiful spring, winter, slash day. Uh, my name is Dwight Carter. I'm the Director of Student Support Systems. Uh, here at Eastland Fairfield, uh, we are really doing a, um, being intentional at connecting with our community. And the community spans 700 square miles, 16 uh, districts, 17 high schools. And so, so this year we started a, community, or a series of community conversations. The first conversation was a couple months ago. It was about um, financing college. The second conversation is tonight, which is a very important topic. Um, Carla Hyman is going to share some really um, hard-hitting data about this, uh, this important topic and how it impacts our students, not just locally, but across the country. And then our third session will be later in April. But again, our whole point is to um, build a bridge between the schools and the community and really talk about pressing issues that impact our lives as a whole. So Carla Hyman uh, is the founder of Walking Wise, which is an organization that offers sex trafficking education for middle and high school students and their parents. Her mission is to teach young people how to recognize the grooming process used by traffickers and sex offenders that exploits a youth's vulnerabilities. Carla's career spans 35 years. She was the marketing director of her family's manufacturing business and introduced the first organic baby formula in the United States. She was the co-director of statewide uh, energy education nonprofit and served as a senior account manager in the financial industry. Please welcome Carla Hyman. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate you taking the time to learn about sex trafficking and how important it is to teach our kids about this crime. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Miller and Mr. Carter for supporting our program by um, enabling us to pilot Walking Wise Prevention Education in your schools. Um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge that conversations about human trafficking and sexual abuse can create anxiety. So if at any point during this presentation you would like to step out, uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, I encourage you to do so. Uh, so for the parents that are here tonight, I'm just curious if you've had in, if this is your first opportunity to learn about sex trafficking. If it is, would you would you feel comfortable raising your hand? Okay, great. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free at the end of the presentation to um, ask questions if you want to jot them down so you remember. I might be able to answer your question by the time I get to the end of this presentation. So sexual crimes are not new. Uh, they've probably existed since the beginning of time. What is new uh, for the past 10 to 12 years are the electronic devices that we've placed in our children's hands. Today's technology has given sexual predators more access to our kids than imaginable. Um, it's escalated to the point that the US Department of Education has produced guidelines that they've shared out um, that they would like school districts to begin to provide sex trafficking education to kids. So um, we at Walking Wise uh, developed tools for, um, and our mission is to help uh, adults, especially parents, have candid conversations with their kids about sex traffickers. And our overall goal is to empower kids to recognize sexual exploitation and to report it. Um, I'm happy to share out with you that the Academy of Forensic Nursing has endorsed our program and we will be working with them closely here in the near future. Um, forensic nurses bridge the gap between uh, the medical industry and law enforcement. Uh, so they're an important group and they train school nurses. So it's going to be a really wonderful partnership um, and we'll work together to educate kids and parents about sex trafficking. So we've developed a, an 11 part video series. Uh, it's an animated series uh, that teaches a variety of topics and we created an education guide. So there's a lesson plan that goes with each of the videos. Uh, we selected an uh, explainer style animation which is commonly used by businesses to train employees how to do their jobs. So our videos are appropriate for kids who are 11 years and older as well as for adults. So tonight, um, these, are, this is, these are our topics. Tonight we're going to talk about trustworthy versus unsafe adults, 
the grooming process, the sextortion, and the pornography link connected to the commercial sex trade. Our other videos cover male victims, runaways who are targeted, uh, kids who live in rural areas are also trafficked. We talk about the myths that cause people to overlook sex trafficking crimes. And then we talk about the perpetrators. We each teach kids about pimps and buyers, female recruiters, and even family trafficking in our videos. Each of our videos are three minutes long. So I'd like to explain to you the difference between commercial sex acts that um, are the crime of uh, prostitution versus that of sex trafficking. Uh, a commercial sex act that involves sex trafficking has four components to that. That's when they uh, induce a victim with force, fraud, or coercion, or any time a child is involved in a commercial sex act, it is always considered child sex trafficking. So I'm going to be sharing data with you today, some statistics, but I want you to keep in mind that um, this crime goes underreported. So a lot of times the populations used for studies or the focus groups used for surveys can be limited. And so the data might not fully represent the issues, but it is a good place for arts, us to start uh, to learn about this, the subject matter. So why do these crimes go underreported? Children are reluctant to expose the abuse against them be out of shame. You know, the traffickers, they want them to make them feel like it's their fault. They always blame the victim, and the victim believes them. And so there's a lot of shame involved. And then children are fearful. They're still under the control many times of their traffickers, and they're certainly not going to cross that line. They, they know not to, to share out, so out of fear they don't tell. And then children cannot recognize themselves as victims because sex crimes have been normalized. This is especially true when you think of family trafficking. Sexual abuse commonly begins at a very young age, as young as you know, five years old or even younger sometimes. Um, so it's normalized for them. By the time they get older and they start being trafficked, they think their peers are having the same experiences. The one thing we do know, though, is human trafficking is the second leading criminal industry in the United States. Sex trafficking is believed to generate $32 billion annually. Um, this tends to be a cash transaction, so again, this is just an estimate. But we know that human trafficking is on the rise in all 50 states, and more and more culprits are getting involved, criminal elements. Uh, we know the mafia is involved in this, but then also we've got gangs who are now involved in in um, sex trafficking as well as drug dealers. Drug dealers understand that you can sell a drug once and it's consumed once, but when it comes to sex trafficking, you can sell a human over and over again. You can sell them multiple times within a 24-hour cycle. So just like in the, any industry, the commercial sex trade has both a demand and supply component to it. Um, so I'd like to talk about those who buy sex. Uh, until recently, this, these folks tend to get overlooked. We'd focus on traffickers or pimps, um, survivors and victims, and not a whole lot of discussion uh, in earlier days about um, those people who buy sex. But that's, that's starting to change. So uh, Demanding Justice issued a report in 2014 they studied 400 people who purchased sex. Uh, they were overwhelmingly male. In fact, 99% of them were men, and they were between the ages of 18 and 70 years old. 43%, or I'm sorry, 43 was the average age. Within this group, 130 of these folks provided their occupation. 19% worked with children, so they were teachers and sports coaches, military recruiters, and Boy Scout leaders. 21% uh, held positions of authority. They were, they were attorneys, law enforcement, military members, and they were even ministers. And then there is the supply side, and they are the traffickers. 42% uh, of victims are being trafficked by members of their own family. The Bureau of Justice put out a report last year where they you know, focused on the people who were 
um, being prosecuted for these crimes. 92% of them were male, 45%, or I'm sorry, 95% were US citizens, and 66% had no other convictions. Uh, the graphics that we have here, this animation is from our video, The Pimps and Buyers of Child Sex Trafficking. Uh, the first frame is an example of what they refer to as the Romeo pimp, where he seduces a young girl, um, you know, gets her gifts, gets her attention, um, causes her to fall in love with him. And then once he knows he has full control over her, then he traffics her. This is when I refer to the force, fraud, and coercion. This is an example of coercion. And the next frame is what they refer to as the gorilla pimp. And he's using aggression and violence. And, and of course, that, that represents the force. So I'd like to talk a little bit about Ohio. Uh, the National Human Trafficking Hotline every year puts out data. They, they rank the states. So we can see how many tips were called in, how many cases came out, and they ranked the, the states. And earlier this fall, I reported that Ohio was fourth. And when I went back in for this presentation, they're reflecting Ohio as being sixth in the nation for the number of tips and cases that um, are revealed. So that made me really curious. I thought, well, okay, what has changed? So I thought I would just go ahead and chart this out for you so you can see where we fall. Uh, we did have about um, nearly 1,200 reports, or what they call signals, and that would be calls that are made to the tip line, text messages, chats, emails, or um, online tips that are filed. Uh, we had 291 victim or uh, cases and 424 victims. Um, there are eight other states that are trailing closely behind us. Uh, so. Yes, we are sixth in the nation for trafficking. But this is what I'd like you to consider. So this does not look good. But what if we spent our time, uh, our whole mission here at Walking Wise is to educate parents, educate teachers, and students. What if we all knew what trafficking looked like? And, and so we're all sending in signals. We're all reporting it. Suddenly, we're going to show at the top of this chart as being number one, but we, we wouldn't be number one as far as, you know, in a negative light. We'd be number one fighting this crime, and that's the goal. But for right now, we're sixth in the nation, and why is Ohio conducive to trafficking? Well, we are the seventh most populated state in the nation. We've got 11.7 million residents. Ohio's location is within a day's drive of 50% of the U.S. population. And our, our highway network is 10th and the largest in the, in the United States. So, so that means traffickers can transport their victims in and out of our state, or sex buyers can easily flow in and out of our state. And I'd like to talk about Columbus, Ohio. Um, again, the National Human Trafficking Hotline ranked the top most populous cities in the nation, and they ranked Columbus at ninth in the nation. So I talked to a detective at the Central Ohio Human Trafficking Task Force and asked him what he wanted all of us to know about Columbus, Ohio in terms of trafficking. And he said that both uh, drug and uh, sex traffickers target Columbus, Ohio, and that's because of our affluent suburbs. Uh, we have a lot of wealth here in Columbus, Ohio, and if you think about our corporate, our many corporate headquarters, universities, we've got a thriving medical industry, you know, there's a lot of success in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and he also pointed to the fact that we've got something really unique, and that's our, our, our 270 freeway. It circles Columbus. And so um, if you think about our wealthy suburbs, they also circle that 270. They circle Columbus. So traffickers keep their victims on the move at serving sex buyers in our wealthy suburbs. And by keeping them on the move, that makes them undetected. But our lawmakers have been hard at work fighting this crime. Our governor has expanded our human trafficking task force to six. They've, he doubled them, um, so we now have six of them. Uh, according to the detective, there are about 25 full-time officers who work these task force. In, in 2021, we have our own hotlines that people can call in tips to, and we had about 600 calls. So those 25 officers, they have a big job. 
Um, they are interviewing potential victims or people who are ma making the reports as well as fighting this crime. Um, I also want to uh, share with you that our lawmakers have passed laws that are putting stricter pennies, stiff, stiffer penalties against those people buying sex. Uh, for example, when they're convicted, they have to attend John School now so that they understand the crimes that they're committing, um, that they, they understand that a lot of times they're, they're, there's children involved. Uh, there was a recent study of women who had been trafficked, and, um, and the majority of, of them said that they were trafficked younger than the age of 16. So yes, they were adult women being trafficked or part, part of the prostitution, but they were trafficked as children. And this is something that people who are buying sex don't always understand. And then recently, um, this past December, uh, Aaron's Law was uh, passed. And um, this means that Ohio schools will now be providing sexual abuse education uh, to kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, it took seven years to pass this legislation. We are now joining 37 other states. Erin uh, is a woman who was sexually abused between the ages of six and eight. Uh, she was abused by a neighbor and then la later abused by um, an older cousin, I believe. And um, so she is responsible for this law. She's from Illinois, and they were the first state to pass it. And her mission is to, to get Erin's law in every state. Uh, so why is this so important? Well, according to the CDC, one in four girls and one in 13 boys are sexually abused during their childhood. Um, and I'd like to share with you that we have a video, Male Victims, and in there, that video, we explain that boys are very, very reluctant to report crimes against them. And so this one in 13 is a pretty big number, and you know, I, me personally, I, I, I wonder if it's the reluctance that makes that number so, so large. Um, and then something else is that 91% of the sexual abuse is perpetrated by someone known and trusted by the child or the child's family. Uh, this is um, an issue that came to light to us when we had our first 10 videos that were made. We had 25 subject matter experts, uh, forensic nurses, law enforcement, social workers, uh, and even victims that were, looked at our videos and we adjusted them based on their advice. At the end, they said, you need to make a video to teach kids the difference between a trustworthy and an unsafe adult. And this is why, because the, the perpetrators are those people that the kids think they can trust. So why is it so important for a child to have a trustworthy adult in their life? It's because it reduces vulnerability. Children are more likely to report sexual abuse, and predators are less likely to target a child with a trustworthy adult in their life. So I'd like to share our first video with you. It, it, it is three minutes long, and it does, it does explain the difference between a trustworthy and unsafe adult. The trustworthy versus unsafe adult. Ever bought something and wondered if it was authentic or a knockoff? Often the differences are subtle. It can be just as tricky to distinguish between a trustworthy and an unsafe adult. Sometimes unsafe adults try to gain access to young people by first deceiving parents and other adults into believing they're honorable people. Here's how safe adults act differently from unsafe adults. Safe adults do not change their behavior when they're alone with kids. They don't become dishonest, uncaring, or irresponsible. Safe adults do not give gifts to kids that make them feel obligated to give something in return. They do not share personal secrets with kids and make them promise not to tell others or encourage kids to confide in them and then threaten to publicize the information shared, such as embarrassing moments or guilty feelings. Safe adults do not use a child's confessions against them as blackmail in exchange for something of value, such as sexual activity, money, drugs, or labor. They do not promise to keep a secret confidential that involves harmful activity 
such as a child's use of drugs and alcohol. Safe adults do not coax kids into isolated locations to spend time alone with them, such as a car, bedroom, bathroom, basement, or behind any closed door. Safe adults do not display romantic feelings for young people under 18, like flirting or expressing sexual desires. They do not make inappropriate comments about a teen's developing body or violate a child's boundaries, such as insisting on unwanted physical contact, even when it's expressed as playfulness. This can include tickling, hugging, and sitting on laps. Safe adults do not touch a child's private body parts or make contact in ways that feel awkward or embarrassing. Youth leaders, including teachers, coaches, counselors, and religious leaders should not show favoritism for one child compared to other kids, such as offering special favors or individual support that is not made available to the rest of the group. What unsafe adults don't want kids to know? They're masters of disguise, looking to take advantage of young people. If this is your experience, seek out an adult who has earned your trust through safe behavior. Dial 911 if you're in immediate danger, or hand motion the signal for help to alert bystanders. Otherwise, contact a 24-hour hotline for help. As I mentioned, our education guide has a lesson plan that goes with this, and there's about uh, 10 questions and answers that would support a conversation that an adult could have with a child after watching the video. So I'd like to talk about the grooming process. Traffickers begin targeting teens um, very early in age. They uh, tend to, to, to start the grooming process around ages 12 to 14 years old and according to uh, a few U.S. studies, the trafficking really begins for teens around ages 14 to 16 years old. Uh, so there, the risk factors, I'd like to, to go through them one at a time with you. Uh, sexual predators identify vulnerabilities in those that they prey upon by getting to know their victim. So they'll, they'll, they'll just come alongside a child, they'll get to know them, uh, they'll start earning their trust by you know, giving them gifts or, or just becoming a, a trusted friend to them. And then as they're in that process, they'll start identifying the child's vulnerabilities. And then over time, they'll use those vulnerabilities against the child and, and coerce them into trafficking. And, you know, if we think about ourselves, we all have vulnerabilities. And, you know, they change as we age. Um, you know, for, for grandparents, they should know the rest, risk factors for elder abuse, just like children need to know the risk factors for sexual abuse or in trafficking. And so the goal is, is for the, the kids to understand the list of risk factors and think about their own personal lives and which factor might really exist in their life so they can be aware if someone starts to take advantage of them. So children who have experienced emotional, physical, and especially sexual abuse are targeted by groomers. Uh, those with poor self-esteem, uh, kids who have been bullied or lack friendships or submit to peer pressure. Uh, kids who use social media platforms without the proper uh, privacy settings are definitely um, susceptible to groomers. Uh, those with older boyfriends and girlfriends, um, and particularly when drugs and alcohol are being introduced to them. Kids who live in poverty or have volatile home lives, uh, they're going through divorce or a death in the fam immediate family. Again, that is a perfect time for a trafficker to come in and start um, you know, comforting the child and earning that trust. Uh, kids who have a history of running away or are homeless, or those especially living in, in foster care are vulnerable to groomers and traffickers. Um, and children who are uh, rejected over their sexual orientation, you know, maybe pushed out of the home, they end up in the streets, they are highly susceptible, and um, it's reported that this group of children are the most brutalized by traffickers and sex buyers, so they, they truly need protection.
The Grooming Process of Child Sex Trafficking Ever seen a magic trick and wonder how they did it? A trained magician can fool us into believing something that's not real. Similarly, a groomer is a person who is skilled at tricking young people into sex trafficking. Groomers and sex traffickers are often the very same person, hidden in plain sight. They aren't always old and creepy. Groomers can be anyone and any age, a man, woman, neighbor, or family member. They can even be a peer or friend. Groomers are tricky opportunists. They're always on the lookout for unsuspecting kids. They try to connect through social media apps, video game chat rooms, and in public places like concerts and shopping malls. Here are ways groomers might manipulate and brainwash. They often want victims to feel rescued by working to fulfill their every need. Sometimes, groomers seduce young people with expensive gifts to make them look older and glamorous. They may try to become a trusted companion, push boundaries with sexual advances, or promote experimenting with drugs and alcohol. Groomers might disguise themselves by developing a close friendship with the child's parents. They often profess a deep love for their victims, making them feel like the luckiest person in the world. But then, they'll slyly begin to dominate, convincing the victim that life cannot be lived without them. They often dislike the child's family and friends and eventually isolate them. These dangerous traffickers create strict rules and dictate who victims are allowed to talk to. Once in control, sex traffickers use all kinds of tactics. They will often command a victim's daily schedule demand money or require the performance of sexual acts for cash. Shame kids, convincing them their drug use and sexual encounters will be exposed. Use blackmail, threatening to hurt the victim's family if they tell anyone. Take the child's freedom, sometimes through violence and drug addiction, claiming them as their private property. Traffickers often label victims as prostitutes, drug addicts, and criminals, convincing kids they'll go to jail if found out. What traffickers don't want kids to know is they're being set up for child sex trafficking. If this is your experience, reach out to a trusted adult, dial 911 if you're in immediate danger, or hand motion the signal for help to alert bystanders. Otherwise, contact a 24-hour hotline for help. So I'd like to talk about sextortion because this is really big right now. Um, just want to make sure that we are all on the same page uh, as far as what sex sexting is. So um, I provide the definition. Um, it is an act of sending self-produced nude photos or sexual videos to others, typically using a mobile phone. Uh, sexting can lead to sextortion. So the definition for sextortion is it's a form of blackmail. Once the trafficker has obtained sexual photos or videos of their victim, they begin to demand payment. It could be in the form of money or gift cards, um, sexual content. They want sexual contact, co content because they can upload it to porn sites and earn money off of it, or they'll demand sex acts. And um, what's really amazing is uh, often these kids who are experiencing sextortion have never met their trafficker, they've never had a conversation with them. But they can be trafficked by just having instructions sent to them and they follow the instructions. So they don't see their trafficker's face. The cyber tip line is another source where people can call in reports of suspected online child exploitation. And it just absolutely skyrocketed as a result of COVID. Our kids were taken out of their schools, taken out of their activities, and they were at home on their electronic devices. And so the traffickers changed their business model and they too, they went home to their electronic devices and, um, and, and they really exploited the kids tremendously. Uh, there was a 35% increase in, in trafficking uh, when you compare 2020 to 21. 99% uh, of it was child pornography, uh, which is also referred to as CSAM, which stands for Child Sexual Abuse Material. 
I wanted, I don't know if you'll be able to see these numbers in this, this chart, but I wanted to share this with you just so you can see just how explosive it was. Um, so the first column is 2019, and the, uh, the third column, the last column, is from 2021. Uh, so the amount of CSAM or uh, child pornography, and we're talking about the possession, manufacturing, and distribution of it. In 2019, 19, there were uh, nearly 17 million reports that one year. And then in 2021, we had over 29 million reports of it. And for child sex trafficking in 2019, we had almost 12,000 reports. And then two years later, 16,000 reports. Child sexual molestation in 2019, we had more than 4,700 reports. And two years later, we had more than 12,000 reports. And I'll go over one more with you. The online enticement of children for sexual acts. In 2019, we had 19,000 reports. Two years later, it more than doubled, 44,000 reports. So it really was, out, it has gotten out of hand. So I'd like to talk about sexting. Um, the self-generated photos. An organization called Thorn uh, has done tremendous work. This is an organization that was founded in 2012 by actors Demi Moore and Ashton Kutcher, and they really have done some amazing work. They have created software that has uh, really helped law enforcement and um, also another set of software It's enabling them to take pornography of children off uh, these porn sites. Uh, they, they do a lot of studies. So they measured sexting behavior of 600 children ages 13 to 17 years old. And they found one in five girls and one in 10 boys uh, said that they had shared self-generated nude photos and, and videos. Uh, one in three of those kids who shared said that they uh, shared the material with someone they had not met. 40% of the group believes that sexting is normal conduct when in a romantic relationship. They also uh, measured attitudes of those kids who sexed, and these kids said, it's okay to share nude photos and videos of yourself with someone as long as you have never met the person. Um, that was 9% 9 9 of girls, 11% of boys. It's okay to share if they don't show it to someone else. 22% of girls said this, 31% of boys. It's okay to share as long as your parents, caregivers, and the schools don't find out. 19% of both girls and boys said this. Um, so in looking at their website uh, just today, uh, Thorne had in gigantic font, 22% of minors are are um, sexting right now. So that's a lot of kids. And I want to share with you as well, in December, this past December, uh, Homeland Security and the FBI sent out a security alert letting parents know that um, last year sextortion was, was, was explosive. They had uh, a 1,000 percent increase in sextortion. Uh, the primary target was boys 14 to 17 years old, there were 7,000 reports of it and 3,000 cases. Um, and in some of the literature that was put out, um, a, a dozen boys had committed suicide. Uh, the culprits were out of Nigeria, and they're posing as young teenage girls. They send a, a photo to a boy, and over time they convince the boy to return a photo back. So it's important that parents explain this to both boys and girls. This extortion scheme of child sex trafficking. Ever think extortion only happens to wealthy people on TV? The evil villain uses humiliating photos to blackmail the successful politician for money. Cell phones make kids vulnerable to a similar crime called sextortion. Kids are pressured to send naked photos of themselves. Then they're threatened to comply with ruthless demands to prevent humiliation. Sextortion can be committed by anyone, including exes, 
cruel classmates, and dangerous online predators. They often threaten to reveal photos to family and friends as blackmail. Sexting photos can seem harmless, especially to kids who have been exposed to online porn. But it's illegal to text or email nude pictures of kids, even self-produced images. Law enforcement classifies these photos as child pornography. Social media apps create a dangerous entryway for sexting and sextortion. Here's how electronic devices create the perfect storm for sextortion. First, young people can have a natural tendency to trust and share. Second, the hidden sex traffickers ooze with kind, reassuring, and inquisitive replies. Posting photos and comments is like dropping breadcrumbs for manipulative strangers to follow. Over time, posts reveal your age and activities, where you live and attend school, and the stability of your relationships with family and friends. Child sex traffickers have a knack for recognizing lonely, unhappy, or self-doubting kids. They gather the breadcrumbs shared online, then cleverly engage them in conversations. This is called the grooming process. Nobody gets me. I understand you. I'm so bored. Is your family ignoring you again? I'm so ugly. You're the prettiest girl I know. Really? You think I'm pretty? Yeah, and you have a hot body. Once the request for sexual photos begins, the pressures don't let up until kids give in. These private photos are prone to be circulated as a weapon against them. The demands for more photos, money, or in-person meetups are enforced with threats against kids and their families. After all, social media posts can give sextortionists a roadmap to our homes. What sextortionists don't want kids to know is, they're a victim of coercion, but the law is on our side. If this is your experience, reach out to a trusted adult. Dial 911 if you're in immediate danger, or hand motion the signal for help to alert bystanders. Otherwise, contact a 24-hour hotline for help. So the last topic that we'll cover tonight for the videos is the pornography link to the commercial sex trade. And to be honest, I have to say that I spent 20 months uh, researching uh, sex trafficking. And when it came to pornography, uh, I guess because pornography is very gra graphic, there's n nothing hidden to the imagination, the, the studies and the research was so graphic, it was a very difficult thing to, to, to read. Um, so I think this is one of the most important subjects to talk about with kids in addition to, sex, to this extortion. Um, pornography is pushing, being pushed to our kids. Um, it starts at 11 years of age, um, which is average. Why do kids view the pornography? Well, 62% of kids 11 to 13 years old who viewed the pornography said that it was unintentional. You know, it was pushed to them. Well, why does that happen? Well, they, they start pushing pornography to kids. It's free. They want kids to have full access to it. It's addictive, just like gambling and drugs. It's addictive. And so by the time they turn 18, you know, this is a thriving industry. They can pay for subscriptions. And uh, so that's the whole intention behind pornography, uh, porn sites, is for paid subscriptions. 63% of teens who intentionally searched for porn said they did so for sex education. So if you think about that, you know, they're curious, they want to know what the expectation is of them, and so they're going to pornography to find out. Um, the, the studies indicated that boys view pornography alone in secrecy, but girls view pornography with their boyfriends typically. Um, and, and a lot of girls are, are viewing pornography. So again, they want to know what the expectation is of them. So what is pornography? Back in the day when um, Playboy first published, it was photos of nude bodies and then you know, for those of you who are old enough to know when Hustler came out, um, you know, people really got upset because it was so graphic. 
but now, you know, pornography, the definition of it is, it's a product that displays new bodies and sex acts, um, often involving aggression, violence, and rape, typically inflicted upon women. So how is pornography delivered to children? Through song lyrics, music, photos, videos, gaming, and cartoons. 86% of pornography is viewed using mobile phones. And the most common, according to a study with kids, the most common flat platforms identified by the kids that they viewed the pornography was Snapchat, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, studies reviewed that the teens seeking the porns on these platforms paid for it, a lot of them. So I want to talk a little bit about animation. Um, anime and manga is um, an animation that was originated in Japan, but it's very popular in England and in the United States. Um, and usually the, the features of the characters are your know, large eyes and you know, small nose and small mouth. And, and there, from what I can tell, there's, there's nothing wrong with this animation. Um, but unfortunately, hentai is a pornographic anime and manga. And um, it's just as graphic as the pornography described before, involving you know, violence and aggression and even rape in these cartoons. Uh, there was a study that was conducted with 1,100 anime fans. 25% of those folks were hentai fans. 70% were male, 25% were female. They started viewing, or the mean age of that group was 25 years old. And they viewed hentai, um, the mean length of time was 11 years. So they have been viewing pornographic uh, animation as teenagers. How is pornography uh, a component of the commercial sex trade? Well, for the definition, pornography meets the legal definition of trafficking if the pornographer uh, recruits entices or obtains young people for the purpose of photographing sex. How do sex traffickers use porn sites to drive income? Well, again, they post online, uh, or they post photos and videos online to generate income, and the, they advertise their victims so that uh, sex buyers can purchase their victims from porn sites. Uh, Thorne and the University of Arizona uh, estimated online sex customers. They uh, did a study over 15 major U.S. cities. They estimated that 5% of all males over 18 years of age responded to the sex ads, that the online sex ads that they had placed. So um, a lot of money, again, is generated by selling uh, young people online through porn sites. The conditions leading to entry into porno uh, pornography are much like the risk factors of sex trafficking. Uh, those who are targeted are, are young people living in poverty or um, there's deceptive job offers. So when I mentioned force fraud and co coercion to you, uh, this is the fraud. So they think they're getting job offers for modeling careers and acting careers. Uh, kids or young people who lack education or job training are targeted, as well as uh, those who have had childhood physical and sexual abuse in their lives. So I'd like to share our, our last video for the night is um, the pornography link. The pornography link to child sex trafficking. Ever ridden your bike downhill and experienced the thrill of speed? But then... Anxiety sets in once you're no longer in control. That's how the human brain experiences overexposure to nudity and sex on the internet. Curiosity is normal, but what may seem like a harmless search for knowledge can develop into a powerful craving for sexual images and videos. This is called a pornography addiction, which impacts an escalating number of young people and adults. In fact, 42 billion visits were made to one major porn site alone in just one year. Here's how viewing pornography can lead to addiction. Each time pornography is viewed, a chemical called dopamine is released into the brain, creating a sensation of happiness and satisfaction. 
After consistently flooding the brain with dopamine and pleasure, the brain's reward circuit becomes rewired, causing a porn addiction. The brain's hunger for reward creates non-stop clicking from image to image. This can cause brain fog to set in and low motivation to do anything else. Pornography is usually viewed in secrecy, which can lead to isolation, depression, and poor self-esteem. Other addictions like drugs and alcohol are expensive and the substance eventually runs out. But the porn industry provides an endless stream of free online porn, making it impossible to click to that last image. So, what does porn have to do with child sex trafficking? Victims can be more easily controlled by traffickers once they've been coerced or blackmailed into making pornography. Traffickers convince victims that there's no escaping the sex trade once their faces are revealed in pornographic photos and videos. And the pornography and sex trafficking industries work together to fuel the sexual exploitation of young people. Functioning as a marketing tool, porn sites are often used to advertise the sale of victims to sex buyers. When pornography fails to satisfy, some addicts can be driven to purchase young people for sex. Children are the most innocent victims of the porn industry, including isolated kids hooked on viewing obscene images through phones and game consoles, and young people who are harmed in the making of pornography. The endless cycle of online humiliation and victims who are sold by sex traffickers through porn sites. What the porn industry doesn't want you to know is, those who appear as models and actors are often unwilling victims. If this is your experience, contact a trusted adult for help. Call a 24-hour helpline or seek out support websites. So the last thing I want to talk about tonight are the indicators that show up when a child's being trafficked. And um, I guess I'm, I've saved this for last because I think this is one of the most important things we can walk away with is uh, what are we seeing out there when we're looking at children? Uh, you know, a lot of times an indicator uh, might be obvious, right? But usually they're subtle. Uh, it, it usually takes a lot of indicators to really show up, and it takes a community often to do that. And where do kids spend most of their time? They spend it, you know, at home with their parents or at school. And so it takes that community. And if you think about a bus driver, a bus driver has a lot of times a direct viewpoint to a child's front door or the bus stop and they get a feel for who's sitting at the bus stop waiting for that child or the school secretary might notice suddenly this child keeps being pulled out of school um, early dismissals well ch children who are trafficked commonly go to school and it's it, and traffickers will actually pull a child out of school to serve a buyer during the day and then you think about a resource officer might notice an, a, a person loitering around the school at the end of the day waiting for the kid to get out of school. Or the school nurse might notice that suddenly there's um, a, you know, the absenteeism rate has gone up for a child. And then teachers can see a child sitting in the class where they're exhausted or distraught or their grades had dropped. And then parents are wondering why their child just has suddenly withdrawn from family life. Well, maybe one of those indicators would not tell the whole picture, but when you put them all together, um, it's definitely red flags. So I'd like just to take the mo a moment here and just go through each one of these um, for us to consider. So as I mentioned, a sudden academic decline. Um, a child who displays exhaustion, depression, distress. A child who's chronically missing from school or they suddenly have a change in their peer friendships. You know, their old friends are out and now they're hanging out with new kids. Uh, they have an older or controlling boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, suddenly they're promiscuous uh, or they make inappropriate sexual references or their online persona because, becomes sexualized. Or you might see a, a child out in public who just won't make eye contact, won't answer questions, or if they do, the questions sound, or the answers sound rehearsed. Uh, suddenly, you, you see a child who has a new phone, new clothes, expensive jewelry, they suddenly have excess of cash, or they have credit card in hand. Or a child who has a change in appearance or personal hygiene, 
or suddenly their physical health starts to decline or they look malnutritioned or they could appear inappropriately dressed for the season or the weather. As I mentioned, you know, children will be transported from a, a warm state to you know, middle of winter wearing summer clothes. That's definitely a red flag. Or kids who are show signs of physical trauma such as scars, bruises, new tattoos. Traffickers, they brand their victims with tattoos. And then when indicators really show up, is when a ch child starts talking a lot about traveling to other cities or out of state frequently, or it becomes apparent they have multiple sex partners, or they're actually being s seen at disreputable hotels or motels, or they're hanging out with people that um, are gang members, or you know, known to be in trafficking or drug dealing. So, thank you so much for your time.